after these six weeks, I started to struggle again, but I decided to go on a different path. Like Robert Frost says, the road less traveled. I decided to go on a path to see if I could find the health within Terry, because I was going down the path where the psychiatrist wanted to put me on heavy medication and maybe trial me in a place. And I decided, no, I want to see if I can find that part of me that at so many times in my life, I felt alive. I felt comfortable in my own skin. I felt vibrant. I loved life. And I thought... Because I had experienced this health from nowhere, I was curious. I was thinking, where does this invincible summer, like, has it been within me all the time? And if so, what's covered it up? How do I uncover it again? This is Hope to Recharge. I'm Atana. I'm here to guide you and support you through your challenging times, navigating through depression, anxiety, and other mental health struggles. This episode is sponsored by our incredible sponsor from the beginning, BetterHelp.com. That's BetterHelp.com, the leading online platform for therapy. Many people come to me for help. And one of my questions are, have you been to therapy? Are you willing to go to therapy? I am not a therapist. I don't claim to be a therapist and I don't do the therapist work. And I think it's something that has to be done with a therapist side by side. Some people have been to therapy for many years and then they come to me to do the work. I often say if you haven't been to therapy and if you want to start working with me, you need to start working with a therapist as well. Very often, it is very expensive. BetterHelp is a leading online platform for therapy that is affordable. You don't have to leave your house. You can get it from the comfort of your sofa, your bed, your office. It's one click away. There are thousands of licensed clinicians on this platform. It's incredible. If you want to get 10% send off your first month, use the link in the show notes, betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Use the link below and start your therapy from the comfort of your home. Sometimes it's so overwhelming to go to therapy. Nowadays, most therapists are on Zoom. Most clinicians are on Zoom. Let's say you travel a lot. Let's say you just don't like getting out of your house, but you want a therapist. It's so affordable. It's worth taking a look. If you're thinking about therapy and you don't know where to start, go to betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. That's betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Millions of people from all over the world are using them. Start your wellness now. Thank you for joining me here today. I am with Terry Rubenstein from London. She is the founder of iHeart, which we're going to hear more about soon. The author of the book, Exquisite Mind. It's your memoir, how you recovered from mental health challenges, your own journey with mental health, how you came across resilience. You just told me that there's an additional part of uh, update of this book that you want to share with the audience. You're very passionate about the topics uh, that sometimes are misunderstood with the mental health community, with recovery, with addictions, with labeling. And you're very passionate on the topic of resilience. And we're going to speak about in this episode, are we looking for resilience in the right places? What is resilience? And how can we educate children and families and maybe even communities to look at resilience in the right way? and to ignite it in their life early on and to maybe exercise it and understand how to use it. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Terry, I, I want to tell you something very ironic. Last week, I met with my podcast mentor for five years. I'm very close to her and we decided to set aside time. A few months ago, we just said we're going to set aside time and we're going to meet in Florida for like a little mindset focus, I would say workshop, or just to like, just connect. And uh, we invited this other lovely public speaker woman that I came across a few years ago, but I became her friend. And when we spent time with her, she was telling me that her mission is to speak about resilience in the world. I met her, we were talking on the same stage a few months ago, and I was blown away for, by her. And she read out to me the definition of resilience. I said, what is resilience? Let me just give you a background on her quickly. She really? was paralyzed from the neck down for a few months. Neck wow. down, she hardly, she, and her lungs were shutting down. Now she walks, she talks. She's almost, I would say, 90-something percent recovered. And it was all in the mind. And she was saying it was it's due to toxic relationships that she was in. And the second she removed herself from the toxic relationships and she decided to work on healing, that's when her body started healing. And she read to me, and I want to read, read what she read to me from Google 
the definition of resilience, and I hope I'm going to find it now. Okay. Resilient is the capability to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties. And she emphasized the word quickly. I want your thoughts on that. I think that's the dictionary definition, and it's a, I'm not sure about the quickly, but it's one of the dictionary definitions, and it's a lovely one, because as humans, we built to withstand difficulty. So there's nothing missing or lacking in us that we are deficient in any way to withstand difficulty. So there's something nice about, and there's another dictionary definition is to return to where we were, which kind of gives you a sense of, but to shiver, the, to return to who we are. And what I love about that is that we are whole to start with. That's at least the premise of a lot of the work that I do at iHeart, an organization that I founded and run. And we, we talk about innate well-being, that we are whole to start. And then that there are almost barriers that cover that wellness. And if we can learn what those barriers are, we can learn how to uncover them and return to who we really are, our true essence. I have a slightly different um, definition of resilience, which I'm happy to share with you. Maybe it'll make a little bit more sense in context of my story and some of the learning I do. So maybe we'll share that and talk about that a little bit more throughout this, this discussion. Yeah. So I want to hear your definition of resilience. And then we're going to backtrack to how you found resilience and why it was so important to you to focus on resilience versus recovering from mental illness or what is what was it in the resilience versus the brain exercises and the neuroplasticity? Let me, I think I have to do it the other way around. Let me okay. share with this, I think it'll be helpful a little bit about my backstory and then they'll understand how the definition of resilience emerged from that mm -hmm. because it didn't come up in a vacuum. So let's give it its context. Just, and I'll do it as succinctly as possible, the short version. I was somebody who struggled with mental health issues growing up. As is common with a lot of people, it was sometimes I did exceptionally well in life and I flourished. I was a high achiever, put a lot of pressure on myself to do well. And sometimes I was just really thriving in lives and other times I was really struggling. And it's, you know, the, it was very extreme, the differences between these. It wasn't like a kind of subtle curve or a gentle curve of life. I remember being a very young girl and looking into the world and feeling like the world had all the power and I had little, and I almost felt that in order to readdress this imbalance of power, I needed to be more, I needed to get more. And it looked to me like, what was that more that I needed? I needed to be prettier and thinner and smarter and more popular, more seen and more validated. And if I could get all of that, if I could fix and control all of those things, I felt that I would feel okay inside. And of course, as we know, it's actually confusing to most of us still as adults, but I'd assume that we should know that we don't find peace on the inside by fixing our outside world, although we try very hard to do that. And um, so this kind of thinking about how to be thinner and prettier and smarter and thinking about my exam results and who liked me and who didn't preoccupied my mind. And when you think a lot, you feel a lot because there's a direct relationship think, thinking and feeling on two sides of the same coin. So I lived in a lot of intense feelings, anxiety, self-consciousness, on and off feeling. In those days, no one called it depression, but no moods. And the way that I chose, everybody has coping mechanisms or self-soothing strategies that they use to feel better. I used uh, self-harm, which in those days in the 80s was not the trend that it is today. It was very unusual to self-harm. No one spoke about it. There was no social media. And I had an eating disorder, severe anorexia and bulimia in my kind of from the age of 15. And I overthought. I just thought and thought. My mind kept thinking if I could just think more, it would solve the, the problems that I had. I would say that I continued to struggle on and off through my 20s. I got married, found a wonderful husband. I had five children in a short space of time in seven years, five little boys, beautiful boys. We immigrated a few times. We went from South Africa to Israel to London to Israel to London, a lot of moving. And you can imagine for someone who didn't have a lot of resilience, who felt quite struggled with the internal world, landed up in, I think, the age of 29, I think it was February 2003, I basically, I'd had two kind of almost what you'd call suicide attempts when I was a teenager, but I had a major suicide attempt. I took a major overdose. I call it a momentary lapse of reason. I was just so desperate and I landed up in a coma in a hospital in the Royal Free down the road from where I live. 
um, here in London. They didn't know if I'd make it. They didn't pump your stomach um, for whatever reasons. They just wait to see if you'll come out of it. Touch and go. And thank God I did. At that stage, by the way, I'd been in what I called the Great Depression. I'd been in a depression for 18 months, which was the longest I'd ever been in a depression. Usually I came out of it at a certain stage. I came home from the hospital and my tell something happened that like surprised and confused me and delighted me all at once. I felt completely different for six weeks. It was almost as if I was enveloped by this kind of blanket. It felt like a cashmere blanket. And with this, I kind of, the feelings were, I was almost enveloped by this feeling of love and gratitude mm. and feeling whole and feeling good yeah. enough, this deep sense of self-love. My mind felt like crystal clear. It's almost like I, all the mental kind of torture had been sucked out of it and I could see clearly, I could think clearly and life looked beautiful. And I didn't understand this because in Terry's world, um, this is very common for people, I felt that all the things... A whole bunch of things needed to be fixed or at least tweaked in order for me to feel so peaceful. And I hadn't fixed my past, my personality, my weight. I was living in London. I didn't like London. I didn't have a support system. I, I wasn't happy with my husband's personality, the poor guy. I wasn't happy with my personality. There were so many different things, my career options. I, I hadn't been able to study because I'd been looking after my children. None of this had been sorted or even tweaked. And yet I felt better. I felt more than better. I felt whole. Was this right after you came out of the hospital, like the week after, yeah. like right after? Straight after for six weeks, for about six weeks. And then it started to dissipate, but it had enough of an impact in me almost subconsciously. I, I always say in hindsight, when I look back on that period, I came across a poem by Albert Camus, which I always say it's attributed to him that I quote to describe what I discovered in those weeks. And it goes, it says, in the midst of chaos, I find within me an invincible peace. In the midst of hate, I find within me an invincible love. In the midst of tears, I find within me an invincible smile. And in the midst of winter, I find within me an invincible summer. And that made me happy because it meant however hard life pushes at me, there's something within me that is stronger, that is more powerful, that can push right back. End of quote. And what happened is that I decided after these six weeks, I started to struggle again, but I decided to go on a different path. Like Robert Frost says, the road less traveled. I decided to go on a path to see if I could find the health within Terry because I was going down the path where the psychiatrist wanted to put me on heavy medication and maybe trial me in a place. And I decided, no, I want to see if I can find that part of me that at so many times in my life, I felt alive. I felt comfortable in my own skin. I felt vibrant. I loved life. And I thought, because I had experienced this health from nowhere, I was curious. I was thinking, where does this invincible summer, like, has it been within me all the time? And if so, what's covered it up? How do I uncover it again? And I think what happened is I decided to give myself six months. I said, Terry, I'm giving you six months. And within the six months, I want to see if you can. And if not, then you'll go the way of the doctors. I think something that was essential during those six months is it's almost like I fired myself. And what I mean by that is that we don't even rest, realize that our mind's rationalizing and giving us answers to everything all the time. And because I'd been in a lot of therapy, I had a lot of self-awareness about who I am and why I'm like I'm rich. And so I always had answers. Why do you struggle? You're an A-type of sanity because you went through this. Because when those lead you to dead ends, there's no way the to amygdala, go with that. The amygdala yeah. answers that they rapid fire send at you. Yeah. And so what I did is that I'd realized at that moment, I had an insight that none, all my thinking had got me to the lowest point in my life where I almost lost my life. And so I decided that I wasn't going to be interested in my own mind. And it's almost like I became like a child again, child who's learning how to walk. I became childlike in learning how to do life. I was curious. I was observing people. I was reading ferociously every memoir of every human who struggled with anything. Doesn't mean bad or psychologically, physically. Looking for what was it? What was this common thread within mm. humans that allowed them to transcend suffering at the end of the six months, I was a different person. I felt different about myself. I had a lot of insight. I felt like life was moving through me rather than coming at me. And I felt incredibly grateful. I didn't have a critical voice inside my mind anymore. And um, that kind of led me on the slap quest to find out what had happened to me. And I was very lucky to come across various people and methodologies that almost explained to me, oh, how the mind worked what had created all the suffering for me and how it had dissipated. 
such that I touched into this deeper core, this deeper essence of me, this wholeness, this wellness. And as that became clearer and clearer to me and has become clearer and clearer to me over the last two decades of, of doing the work that I do and building the organizations, I've been able to build, create the resilience framework, which is now what we've shared with thousands of people across the world in 22 different countries. And specifically, iHeart, the organization iHeart focuses on young people because I felt that after working with adults for a decade, I felt that almost every adult said, I wish I knew this when we were younger because all of us started when we were younger. So we decided to specialize in parents and the world of the child, parents, teachers, and, and have worked in many schools and trained people to work in schools. And then we also have another organization, Resident Me, which works with adults in organizations. So that's been a, it's just been a wonderful journey that uh, I'm learning all the time from mm -hmm. and still to this day so much. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with me. I had so many questions along the way. So first of all, I want to my first question that popped into my mind was like, was it the overdose? Like, I'm thinking people are going to listen to this and say, oh, wait, I'm in the pits of hell. Let me try overdosing and maybe it's going to lift the veil and then I could do it like a restart, like a psychedelic <laughs> experience. It sounds like a psychedelic, like what they say, right? It sounds like a, like, oh, there suddenly was clarity. There was this comfort. So I wanted to like, how, how do you explain in a medical way what happened? Okay, so I don't think you can explain these things. Insight, something that occurs to a person that changes, is to me a spiritual thing. I can tell you what I think happened, and I'll tell you because our framework's built on that, the psychological mechanisms, but why it happened to me then, I think there are many moments in our lives, many moments in all our lives that we're giving opportunities to wake up to something, mm. tr something that's more true. And a lot of the time we miss those opportunities. But the good news is that they keep popping around and sometimes we are awake to them. And when we are awake to them, they're inflection moments. And I'm sure every person in different ways, and my story is quite extreme. The people might have had less extreme, although I'm very conscious that a lot of people struggle a lot more than I have, or I've come across a lot more tragedy than I have. But all humans have had moments where they've seen something in a moment that's changed. Maybe their relationship to a person or relationship to themselves or to life or to what they thought they'd do in the world. And those opportunities are just so happened that I was awake to a moment then. And for whatever reasons, one of my moments happened that had nothing to do with the circumstances. It's always about your mindset. Yeah. So you're saying it wasn't like something like it wasn't a reset button. It was, wow, I almost lost my life. I almost had everything I had. They, I'm living again. Let me not miss this. Let me go deeper and look beyond my pain. Maybe. I'm not sure. You're saying that it, could, it wasn't really to do with the suicide attempt, mm -hmm. because generally speaking, after a lot of people have suicide attempts, you struggle more. Even if you live through them, you struggle more. So I don't think it had to do with that. That's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. But I think for whatever reason, I was gifted to experience peace after that. Wow. I have my own reasons why maybe that happened. And because of that, it made me curious in a way like this doesn't make sense. I'm supposed to be in a depression. Well, why am I feeling this way? Mm. So, yeah. So resilience is, I, I think what I'm understanding from what you're saying is the challenge is six weeks later, is came, the, the same familiar hard feelings and challenges came back. You just learned how to cope with them. And that's what resilience is. It's not, it didn't disappear. So explain no. to me. No. So, that, so let me answer that because you're right. I'm sorry. I forgot to tell, give the resilience piece. The definition of resilience, I'll tell you what I learned, Matana, what I've continued to learn. So a person has, what I discovered is that a person has everything they need inside of them. That's the, that's what you call, it's almost the essence, the most foundational part of us, the essence of the soul. And if people don't like the word soul of the psyche, but it is the most foundational part of us. It's why people like to meditate because when our minds quieten down, our minds are splashing around. We feel the stillness, we feel this peace, we feel this goodness. We have this clear mind, we can think, we can be flexible, we can be optimistic. We know what to do in order to face this life and deal with these challenges. All the resources we need are within us. And all the feelings that we're looking for, those deep feelings of love, not for any reason, just because they just both speak to us. But the thing is, is that it doesn't look that way. It doesn't look like all these beautiful qualities, which I call the qualities of well-being, are built into us. It actually looks like they come from other things. And I'll give you a metaphor to explain this. 
when we're little and we're a toddler or a little baby, when a little baby cries, the parent will give them a comforter, teddy bear, a blanket, a pacifier, and the toddler will hold on to it and feel like all's right with the world, feel a deep sense of security. And they'll start to misattribute their feelings of security to this inanimate object. Because we know that a stuffed animal with beady eyes can't put a feeling of comfort into a child and deep feeling of security, mm -hmm. but they're misattributing a two tip this teddy bear. Now, when we grow up, we might leave our teddy bears behind. But what we do is we create adult teddy bears, things that we now believe have the power to give us a sense of well-being, a deep sense of well-being and take it away from us. We in the resilience framework call these attachments. So we've identified seven main categories of attachments, things that we've made our sense of deep okayness and well-being conditional on. Things like getting things right, success and achievement and status, our loved ones being. We think if our loved ones are okay, we can be okay. And if they can't, we can't. Uh, financial security. Other one is people appreciating us, liking us. Right? If people appreciate and like us, we can feel good and sense of self-worth. And if they can't, we can't. And these kind of attachments, um, a few more, are we, have, we get preoccupied with them. Preoccupied because it feels like they have the power to affect our well-being, to either threaten us or to boost mm -hmm. it. And all that thinking, mm -hmm. the metaphor I give is of sun in the clouds. It's like your well-being is the sun, just like the sun that's a constant. It doesn't go anywhere. It just gets, the sun gets covered by clouds, but it hasn't gone anywhere. It's a constant. Our well-being too is a constant, but it gets covered by the clouds of all our insecure thinking about these attachments. So as humans, sometimes we fully experience our well-being, like I did in most moments. So we experience all these beautiful qualities, but a lot of the time they covered, they haven't gone anywhere. They're not stolen or lost or diminished. It's just that what we're really feeling are these clouds that are covering our, our kind of well-being sunshine. Resilience to me is when a human understands that they have well-being within them, whether they feel it or not. When you understand that, that you have well-being within you, whether you feel it or not, you walk through life with a different kind of confidence. You walk through life that even when you're not feeling your well-being, you know you're fully okay. You know that you're fully whole. You understand the reason that there's a logical reason why it's being covered. And you're curious about that because you want to learn about these deep attachments. Because when we learn and identify them, we can challenge them. And as they fall away, the thinking falls away too, and it frees us. So you're curious. You don't mind what we call in our framework being off track when our well-being is covered, because that's where all your learning is going to happen. So you know that all your learning is going to happen there. That's the Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey, where he speaks about it. We get a call to adventure, and we go on the road of trials. And on the road of trials are where we're carving out a more balanced character. And by the time we return back to where we're a different person. We know that's true in terms of the soul journey in a religious sense as well. So that to me is the knowledge, the definition of well-being. We've got this beautiful slide that we show in our course, which is a person looking at this road of challenges. And there's three versions. One of them, their well-being sun is like around their head. And they're looking at these challenges with the full expression of their well-being. The other one, it's partially covered, this well-being sun. And the third one, it's almost fully covered by clouds. But the... The text says that resilience is knowing that our well-being is always within us, whether we feel it or not. So when you're as a human, you could be that same person, either feeling the full expression and a slightly less expression of your well-being or not feeling it at all because it's so covered. You still have this perspective and this optimism about life yes. because you know that within you, you're whole and you are okay, deeply okay. Hmm. Are we discussing only mental well-being or physical well-being as well? Because I can imagine somebody that's, let's say, fighting stage four cancer will say, no, my body is not, doesn't have what it needs right now. But, or somebody with schizophrenia would say, no, my, my mind doesn't have. I'm sure you get that pushback, people that are not feeling that. And they don't, they want to validate that feeling of, I'm not, I don't have everything within me. What do you answer? This is, what I'm talking about is a spiritual thing. You could call it a psychological thing. Yeah. Psychology is the study mm -hmm. of the soul. That's what I'm um, calling you or the psychologist. So hard for me to differentiate the two, but it's not something that's physical. So it transcends the physical. By the way, one of the attachments that we talk about is to physical health, which that you mm -hmm. can have peace even while your health's deteriorating. 
which is why probably mm-hmm. the story you told in the beginning, the woman was able to find peace through. And we've worked with many people who have had terminal illnesses, who have lost limbs, soldiers whose legs have been all these kinds of things who have experienced a depth of well-being that is incredible. We all know that. We've all come across people like that. And how is that possible? Because it's the two are not, the one is not dependent on the other, which is a beautiful thing to know. But at the same time, Matana, what I want to say is that all of us travel down what I call both these roads, what we call the on-track road, where we experience our well-being and the off-track road when we don't. We all going to for the rest of our lives. I've been teaching this for 20 years and I'm still got attachments and on the off-track road when Mm-hmm. So all of us travel. That's the beauty of being human is that we go down both these roads. We don't always live in the full expression of our well-being, but the real transformational change is to understand that it's within us. This is a human thing. It's, there's no exceptions to it. And that's it's not human and alien. It's a human. Yeah. Beautiful. Hopeful. Right. It's hopeful. Yeah. So what I'm understanding is that the resilience is the tools that we have in order to tweak our vision of what true well-being is. And we can access it. Your resilience, I'd say more than the tools, is the knowledge. It's knowledge. Oh, it's yeah, the knowledge. It's knowledge that, okay. that we have well-being within us, that it's inborn, that it's innate, that it can't be damaged, lost, broken, or stolen. It can't even be diminished. But it is actually the most abundant thing that we have. So that's just a beautiful thing to know as humans. And we've taught this to thousands and thousands of teenagers and young children, as young as eight, nine, many different countries, many different cultures from India to China, to South America, to Scandinavia. And when children discover this, it's almost like their whole world lights up. It's unbelievably empowering. And see yeah. the truth of it. And then they see that in the experience because it gives them the possibility that someone could be mean to them and they could have a a different experience of that because mm-hmm. all they thought that took away their well-being that somehow had power over them and they saw it need mm-hmm. to and it's incredibly empowering and freeing it creates a different kind of world because the world we're walking around in most of us are feeling like we're vulnerable to everything so we feel like why yeah. could be wrecked and cut at all and we and our children are vulnerable to everything which is just not true and it's, it's something that's not the way that we used to many generations ago think about ourselves What are we doing for ourselves? What do we want to be? What do we want to work on? What's important to us? How can we cultivate these small changes in our brain and our day-to-day life with our own tools? I call working with me the VIP program because I handhold you through the process. And sometimes the process is very lonely and hard and frustrating. And you want to just make sure you get it right to guide you through it with somebody that went through it. Sometimes you need a therapist, a psychiatrist, a coach, and somebody like me, somebody that went through the same thing, the same challenge as I did. And I love working with people that are ready to do the work because it is expensive. It's a lifelong investment into yourself, into your future. When you start working with a therapist, with a coach, or with someone like me, you're investing into your long-term stability, into your long-term mental health. People often ask me, can I work with you? How many times? What does it look like? And I say, it's not about how many times. What are you willing to do to show up, to work on yourself, to make the changes? How ready are you? Because if you're not ready, Ready, the investment will go south. You could say, I don't know where I want to go. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't even believe it can, but I'm no longer willing to stay in this position where I am now. Choose yourself. What are you willing to do to bring awareness to yourself, to your mental health, to your stability, to change? How are you going to impact yourself that you will impact the world? If you want to work one-on-one with me, link is in the show notes. Happy to answer any questions that you have. One-on-one with Matana. Schedule a free 30-minute consultation that we can see if you are ready. Be ready for change. Be ready to work hard. Be ready to see a different you. When it comes to an experience, let's say a child is experienced, let's go back to children. Someone says something that makes this well-being shattered, like the well-being is injured, right? Because they have a perception. If this person, if this kid said this to me, or if they didn't include me, or Let's say this idea, I think I I hear a lot that the structure of the home, if there's safety in the home, the kids are safe. Mm -hmm. 
And you're breaking that concept. You're saying, don't make their safety network where they are. Let them build their own internal safety network and give them that ability to rise above. How does that work in the process of it happening? Like when somebody, when the kid is hurt emotionally, they were offended. Yes. So I want to talk to you about the root cause of being offended, where that comes from, and the kind of education we should be giving our kids. First of all, we want to create a safe environment, a home where kids are seen and heard and loved, and and that's part of our, what's not supposed to be part of our role is to helicopter and fix and solve and all their problems. We've got a beautiful, just created a parenting course, an online parenting course called The Secret of Effective Parenting, how to help raise urban Jerusalem children. And the overarching theme of it is prepare your child for the road, not the road for your child. Mm. Your child, oh, I love not that. the road for your child. Because that's essentially what mm. we're doing is trying to fix and prepare the road so that our poor little darling will be mm. able to. And that's not serving them mm. because it's through the challenges our children go through. That's where the learning, that's where they have to uncover more of these beautiful innate resources to work out how to deal with life. In answer to your question, when a person becomes offended, we want to, one of the things our framework does is goes to the root cause of things, right? And so it goes always to the root cause, which in my mind are these attachments. So I'll give you an example. If a child, which most of us do, okay, so I'm assuming most children do at some stage, this kicks in, has an attachment to people appreciating or liking them, right? Which is also fitting in, et cetera. Now, by the way, the attachments that I mentioned and I have mentioned, even physical health, our loved ones are all beautiful things to aspire to. Of course, we want our loved ones to be well. We want good physical health. We want people to like us. These are beautiful aspirations, but it's when we make our inner okayness and our inner sense of security conditional on them, that's when it really limits us because it's not true. Whenever you're living with false beliefs, when we believed the world was flat, we were worrying about the edge. So your mind starts to be preoccupied with, with threats that don't exist. So that's when these attachments become issues, when we make our world be dependent on them. So if that's an attachment for a child, if they need children or other people to like them in order to feel okay, okay, so that's upstream. Just say that's in the bank. They don't even know that exists, but that's how they believe right. life works. And now suddenly a child sits and offends them. That's going to threaten that attachment. And they want to yeah. like them and this person's not liking them. And that's why their mind's going to react. It's going to think in a way, how could they say that? They were so mean. I feel so offended. It's going to, and the mind's always trying to help us. It's always trying to protect us. The mind's our greatest friend. So it's going to, going on getting preoccupied with trying to protect us from a threat, judging the person. It's always trying to pin down the perpetrator in, in help of us, in support of us, et cetera. If you took a child who didn't have an attachment to people liking and appreciating them, they just didn't need everybody to like and appreciate them in order to have a sense of self-worth and a child was mean to them. They wouldn't have that reaction, by the way, which many kids don't. When we go into a classroom, not you know, the kids who just will like be a bit embarrassed with the bully, being mm-hmm. really not thinking mm-hmm. she must be having a bad day or something or walk away or something, but they won't have their reaction because their mind's not going to go into overdrive thinking that there's a, mm-hmm. and feeling what called offended and hurt. So that's... Ultimately, we want to work on these kind of root causes, these attachments, because they're what's behind all the insecure thinking that our mind has. So we're not saying don't feel that way. We could say, yes, it hurt. Mm -hmm. It was painful. And then what? Like now that we address the pain, if somebody calls me fat and I feel fat, I'm going to be offended. If you've got an attachment to people viewing you in a certain way. Because there's a way that a person, somebody can call you fat. I have a son at the moment and he is very, he's put on a lot of weight and all of us rib him off that he's fat and he doesn't mind that he's fat. He has put on some weight and he's like fine about it. And we're all like, what are we, what can we say to make you get a little offended? We all joke with him. So you'll lose weight. And he's like, Mm. nothing. I just, nothing. My wife loves me and nothing. Uh, He doesn't have a attachment to people needing to see him and appreciate him or in a certain way. By the way, so I just want the caveat of not everybody's going to have that response because a lot of people, it's a huge mistake. No, but I, that's why I said, what if I, no, I said, if not, if somebody is conscious about it and it offends and it's 
or somebody that's that's a perfectionist and um, somebody challenged their perfection. Yes. A student that likes getting a hundred. I have a daughter that she, if she gets a ninety four, she yep. feels like a failure. Yep. Everybody thinks she's successful, yep. but in her mind, it's not a hundred plus. Yep. So she's a failure. I could tell her to I'm blue in the face. You're phenomenal. You're amazing. Yep. In her mind, she's not. Yep. So. My question is, it's our personal relationship with that yes, thing. Yes, absolutely. And so that's what we've got an entire framework. It's not something that's just got for children 10 hours of learning. But what it helps them see is two things. First of all, it helps them see that their well-being is within them and their experience is created through them and that nothing can actually diminish that being because when something's in bolt, when something's in bolt till it's a constant, no one or no thing can take it away. Because if it looks like something can take away your well-being, it looks like it can put feelings in you, feelings that can either give you more well-being, make you feel better, or feelings that can make you feel worse. So we teach them deeply about this concept and give them a lot of proofs. And we do this with adults as well, and a lot of experiential exercises. So they start to see the truth of that. And at the same time, we show them why that doesn't look true. We show them about these adult teddy bears. We show them about these beliefs and they start to see, yeah, that's true. I do have this attachment that I need to achieve in order to be okay. And then they start to see all the thinking that they have and all the stress that they have is a result of that. And we help them to what we call poke holes, challenge these beliefs. A belief is something that a human makes up. It's not truth. David Bowman, the scientist, talks about if something's real, it doesn't move. It's solid and it doesn't matter how much you poke at it, it won't move if it's truth, if it's real. How do we know if something's not real? You start to poke at it and it starts to move, right? And he's talking conceptually. Mm -hmm. We start to poke holes and challenge the logic of these beliefs. We've got all questions that we call to facilitate insight. And as, because there's a part of your mind that believes that's true, that believes that you seriously won't be okay unless you get those results, unless you achieve, unless you're the best, unless you get it right. So it's almost like you're re-educating this part of yourself, which is trying to protect you. It's not, it's really trying to protect you because it wants you to be okay. And you're saying, oh, you need to let it know that you're already okay. And then in fact, it's not actually helping you because it's actually making you so stressed. <laughs> it's actually creating a lot of distress for you. So it's doing the opposite mm. of what it intended. So we take them on a journey of really starting to challenge these attachments. And as they weaken and fall away, they start to see the possibility of having a different experience. We also, again, we show them psychological samples because a lot of people don't even know when we're going off track. We only we're deeply suffering before we even realize that we're trapped. Mm. So we give them a lot of early psychological samples so that they can almost catch it earlier and then start to really challenge what's behind it. Mm. So I'm going to take you to your, I, I want to know how you did the exercise on your own personal journey. So you said you struggled with bulimia and anorexia. Those are very difficult mental illnesses to overcome. I'm wondering, do you not struggle with it anymore? If you look in the mirror and you see yourself completely the way your mind should have seen you before, are you okay if you'll gain pounds? Is your mind really in a place I don't know the topic well, but what I understand from people that I spoke to, their mind sees it differently, their body image differently. So did resilience change the way you see yourself and you no longer struggle with anorexia and bulimia? So, so let me tell you about stages because healing happens in stages. But my insight that I told you about was unusual in that it was quite transformational. Like the change that happened mm -hmm. my husband often says to me, like, I wish people that I lived with you. So he always says, I'm a witness of you really changed. Of course, I was still Terry and of course, I've still got my stuff. It's, I didn't become this perfect angel. I'm really not. And I still, but a lot about of my identity um, fell away in that moment. And I believe Hashem gave me a gift maybe because of the journey as part. I'm not sure why exactly. But we don't know the mind of God and why everything works out how it does. But one of the things that happened is that there was a moment where on my journey during those six months, which was very up and down, it wasn't just like me doing better and better. I was really up and down, but I was very focused mm -hmm. on looking for those glimmers of well-being within myself. When before my mind was always really fixated on the suffering, I was now more fixated and interested in the wellness, which is not where humans usually gravitate towards. Some minds usually gravitate towards the dirty corner of the room, whatever's 
Mm. So I had a different orientation. So I was starting to notice this kind of well-being that would pop up in the middle of a difficult day or something and go, wow, like, how did that happen? It must be. And it gave me more confidence in it. But I had this moment where my mind was starting to get quieter and quieter as a lot of the thinking that I had before which just started to fall away. It didn't look true. And I had a moment where I just completely fell in love with myself. And, and I don't mean it in a statistical way. I, I, I recognized that I was a soul. I, I can't, mm -hmm. my essence. And I saw it was beautiful. And, and mm -hmm. I, I, I say, I'm not sure if I wrote this in that in the book, but I turned mm -hmm. around to my husband. He came into the room. We're going out to a wedding. And usually he used to always say, you look so nice. And I used to say, I don't. That's what I always said. Mm -hmm. And I actually turned to him and said, don't I look beautiful? Oh, wow. So it's inside beautiful. It's not that. Wow. Like, and he was like, what? Like he was. Oh, wow. And that was like a real moment. And all the things that I thought needed to be fixed, my nose and my weight and my this and my that, they didn't look because there was a way that I touched something deeper in me. So that was a very healing moment. And it almost gave the impetus for me to go on a journey. I think I've got a lifelong journey with my body because just to tell you that the the eating is a and the body image is probably went down from being like a hundred percent part of my preoccupied with to maybe ten percent of my thinking now. More like the regular person would have. So oh, I feel a bit uncomfortable and I put a but I still there's still a residue of not respecting my body, not listening to my body. A lot of the time there's a when you have an eating disorder, it's almost like you live from the head up. You live over here. Mm. Just respect your body because mm. how can you treat your body, mm. right? Mm. So I, for many years, even when my eating settled down, I disrespected my body. If I got ill, I pushed it through a lot of pain. I mm. didn't care, didn't mm. look after it. I used to bother my husband. I was like, mm. why? My mind's so strong. doesn't matter about mm -hmm. Until God, as he does, with absolute love, he gives us these opportunities to learn. He puts us back in school and gives us a little whack and says, okay, now your body's not working. You've got to learn how to take care of this. As, uh, you are, you're not just a mind, you're a body, you're a whole being. Yeah. And so I've been on a continuous journey of, of learning how to listen to my body, learning how to integrate it into the rest of me. I think that's my work right now. And for sure, like emotional eating, I'll still sometimes when I'm off track, because when we're off track, we don't feel good. So we look for things to look mm. better because we anyhow based in a logic where we think there's something out there that can make us feel better. It feels like the world has power of our feelings. We look to something that our minds associated. So sometimes I'll still look to food. But I must say generally, like uh, I'm extremely grateful that, extremely grateful because as you say, it could be it's such a painful journey. And it's something that so many people can get so stuck in. But there is, again, this hope for people, you know? So resilience is not a destination. It's a way of living. And it's constant working with the awareness that we have. So it's not, like they say, healing is not a destination. It's a constant evolution. And once we heal one part, we'd go to the next part and to the next part. And sometimes we have to go back to a part that we thought yeah, we healed yeah. and we have to redo it. Yeah. Right. So that's what I'm understanding that resilience is just like this, these, these, this incredible internal system that we can tap into that we have in us. And the more we tap into it, the, the masks, these clouds are going to shift. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to be there. Yeah. And there, it could be that it could be cloudy very often, but we have the ability to change the weather, maybe bring some sunshine into a very cloudy day. Yeah. With this resilience. Well, resilience isn't even about changing anything. You might have changed, but resilience is about a perspective on us. The relationship with the thought, the relationship, because our thoughts lead up to our emotions. Because So you're saying it's the relationship between these two. I think two. my tana even bigger than that. I think it's a, a perspective, it's a knowledge. It's like when a person, you think about a lot of people will say you should have belief in God to a religious person. You should have belief in God. Or why are you so worried? There's a God and there's nothing else but him and you should have belief in him. And people are like, okay, I know you should believe in God, but I'm really worried about this. It's difficult. But mm. Mm. when a human really believes in God, has had an experience of God mm. for a great website and there's 
I'm interviewing some woman who'd lost children very tragically. And something happened in that moment that they knew God, they saw God. It was almost like they felt he was communicating with them, not in a schizophrenic, in a real deep way that they were mm-hmm. lifted and they could see that this was a perfect thing, even though it was extremely painful, extremely painful. Mm-hmm. And um, there was something about that carried them through the healing process and pain where it didn't look like this was suffering. It just looked like this was perfect. We are on team God, like this is his perfect world. And we need to now learn how to live with the um, shift that this person is not present in our life, still present, but in a soul form, in an infinite form. But there was a different perspective they had about that whole journey where sometimes they were doing amazing and like really just basking in God's goodness, they'd say. And sometimes they were on the floor in so much pain. But regardless of it, there was almost a, a backdrop of feeling like, this is perfect and this is the way it's meant to be. They had that mm. sense. And it's the same thing with resilience to me. When a human, and you've got to insightfully know this and experience this, you can't tell yourself this. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a deep knowledge of the fact that you hold, that you've had these incredible qualities and resources within you and that they are always there, even if you can't feel them and access them, but they're always there. And when you know that, there's just a confidence, there's a perspective, this optimism that you feel as the backdrop of life, no matter how much you're hurting or struggling or et cetera, there's a backdrop of feelings. So you must say to someone, I'm really feeling bad, et cetera. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. It's not telling you. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. You're like, I, and you're ready. Okay. I got this. I got you know? this. There's a different yeah. perspective about what it means to be human and struggle. Mm. So it's more of a spiritual experience. I don't think I'd call it a spiritual experience. All the work that we do in IHAR and Resilimi, I'd say that like 95% of it is not to spiritual people, not to Jewish people, not to spiritual. That's what I was yeah. going to ask, because it sounds like you're saying that it's bigger than us. It's bigger than the mind. It's an experience. But at the same time, they say, mm-hmm. and the end of knowledge, belief starts. Mm-hmm. So... How do we teach this to children? Because they're very cognitive. They're like, so you're talking about the yedia, the knowledge. What if the child doesn't feel that knowledge? How do we teach that? I'll give you two. From the perspective of our heart, when we teach this program through our pro- different programs, we've got a digital program called Ignite, which is for 9 to 13. And then we've got a longer, more in-depth face-to-face program, which we've trained about a thousand people to deliver to, to young people. And in terms of that, they're very... When something feels logical to you, your mind takes it on. The reason your mind took on these, what I call adult teddy bears, is because it could look logical mm. to them. But if it's true, mm. when, a, when a child sees, oh, that's not true. I thought oh. it's true. It's not. Oh. You logically take them through a journey to show them, yeah, what the true logic. I love yeah. that. I love yeah. that. I love that. So basically you're saying they are programmed to think a certain way and we're telling them, oh, what if the truth that you know is really not the truth. Let us introduce you to a different way of thinking, of processing, of feeling. Exactly. And let's examine that. Let's challenge it. Let's yeah. It oh, I love that. Let's prove oh, it. I love it. Okay. All together. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. It. So it's not like, it's not telling them what you're experiencing is not true. Let's look at it a different perspective. Let's try something else. Yeah. How's that? My, uh, I have a friend that always says, how is that working out for you? Would you like something else? Maybe what? would you, are you willing to experience something else? If that's not working, if that way of thinking is not working out, are you willing to maybe think of a different way of thinking of things and create and being, I know we're short on time. I want to, I'm a student of Tal Ben Shahar. I've been in his program of happiness study Academy for years. Yes. I healed, I, I want to say one of, he was my mentors in healing my mind and getting off of all of my medicines. And I read all of his books and I practiced his stuff. And really, like I could say, I live a life. I, I experience the great fullness of life, the ups, the downs, and I experience it and I live it and I love Beautiful. it. Beautiful. And I'm not afraid of Beautiful. it. So I'm still weekly calls with Tal Ben Shahar. And he, one of his Big MOs when it comes to happiness study, he says, permission to be human. You cannot pursue or be hum- uh, or be happy or even go on the goal of being happy without the permission to be human. Feel it, experience it. It's right. And he talks about the pyramid of the well-being, huh? the, like the finance, the relationships, all the things that you bought. He's like, these really affect our happiness. And don't tell yourself it doesn't. 
Because when you tell yourself it doesn't, you're removing yourself from the human society. And we're human. We feel. What is your relationship with that, with the permission to be human and resilience? So first of all, I think definitely my issue is that it's very easy to tell someone, just be human, be okay with feeling. And then as you say, see how that goes. Most people will say, okay, yeah, sounds great, but I'm terrified. What do I do? But they mm -hmm. don't. So you got to, what, what we spend a lot of time doing is explaining to people why they think, feel and behave in the way, in the way they do, because the psychological system is an incredibly intelligent system, just like all systems, just like gravity, just like the digestive system, just like the weather system. It has a logic to it. It has a predictability to it. The mind's not random. You don't suddenly wake up and feel bad for no reason. That's this, there's a logic. It's almost an input output. There's a way that we thinking the way we are because of a belief that we have. And so the mind's reacting to that and then we feeling it and, and that's creating a response in us. Once people understand that, and we have many different metaphors and ways of showing that, it almost calms them down because what frightens us is what we don't understand. When we see how the mechanism of how something works, when I was running a marathon, for example, when my, I got like, tore a muscle or got injuries, when I understood why, it was enlightening for me. I saw, oh, it was because you overran and you didn't rest. And there was something about the buildup of lactic acid. And then it made sense. And then I knew what to do. So once we understand the mechanisms, the inner workings of our mind and how the human experience is created moment to moment for us and why it's created in one way as opposed to the other, what creates stress? How come I, my, what, sometimes I feel peaceful about this and other times I don't? When all these questions are answered, when you almost get the, it's almost like you learn the equation. In an eight, you learn like addition and then suddenly you can do multiplication and division. You understand mm -hmm. all the complexities of men's because you've learned this mm -hmm. addition. So that to me is important. I think that once a human being understands that, which is basic education that we all sort of gotten in, in grade one when we were young uh, with geography and science and everything else we learn, then we're able to be comfortable with the human experience because we understand it. It's not that because when pe people feel uncomfortable, it's because they feel out of control. They either feel like something's wrong with me and I don't like it and I don't know what to do about it. Like I'm just a stress ball. I'm just somebody who's intense or something's wrong with life. Life's dictating how I feel and I don't like that because I can't control life. But when they start to see that neither are right and there's actually a predictable, logical way the mind's working and there's a way that I can learn something about it in order to gravitate towards experiencing more of the goodness and, and not being so frightened, as you say, I think that allows us to settle down in the human experience. So I think that it comes with knowledge and information, that ability mm. to be able to be okay. And then the only other thing I'd say, and, and, and I don't really understand, so I'd need to obviously look more into, I hate commenting on people's work when I haven't looked into it. Yeah. Official, but with the I heart, the resilience framework, it's not in any way saying don't be in life. It's saying be in life. And the more you're in your well-being, the more engaged you are. Because well-being is not a passive state. It's not a state of ambivalence or just, oh, I'm just so in doubt. It's a state where we're incredibly energized and productive and our best selves and got our best thinkings. So we very engaged and we know how to navigate relationships in a very healthy way. We know how to think about finances in a way that's very healthy and considered, et cetera. But it's just the shift is that it doesn't feel to us like these things have power over us. More it looks like we have the resources to engage with them in a healthy way. The dynamic shifted because it's not true that these things have power over us emotionally. It doesn't work that way. The mind is creating life. As David Bohm says, thought creates reality and then says, I didn't do it. She did it. They, right, right, it. right. So right. that's what mm -hmm. we're, that's what you're starting to see, which really is freedom of mind. It's really where you have the free will and freedom of mind when you see that, because otherwise we don't feel free. We feel like life's been dictated to us. But so once you have freedom of mind, you can, you engage with the world as it's there for us to engage with. And, and we want to connect with the world. When you connect with self, mm. you want to connect with the world and you can connect to the world. When we're not connected to self, the interaction with the world is painful. So I have two final questions. First, and you can answer this yes or no. Can the work that you do, that you teach, be applied to severe complex PTSD or severe trauma? Mm -hmm. Or do you first have to do trauma work and then your work of resilience? No. So the training that we give is not training people because we train people to take people through an uh, a adults and eight session resilience program. So if you train with us, you get the resources to take people through a program. 
that's not designed to create trauma therapists or experts, but the, the resilience framework and the knowledge of it for sure. I myself have worked mm. with many people who've been through different kinds of PTSD and trauma work and different intense diagnoses for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've trained people mm. to do that as well. So definitely. Mm-hmm. Because by the way, a lot of the work that we do with feelings and helping people to engage with their feelings, which is part of our resilience framework, is very similar to the work that is done in kind of trauma work, deep trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my last question to you is, what part of life do you feel that you have the knowledge, you have the school book, you wrote (laughs) it, What, where do you find it's hardest for you to apply it to your own, the belief system that you were pre-programmed growing up? What part do you find that is the hardest for you to apply the resilience mindset? I think I'd say that we all have our areas which are difficult. And I'd say that most of my attachments have weakened a lot. So they're much softer than before. So the habits that I have are less intense, come less frequently, but they still can arise, as you correctly said. But I think, as I said before, it's all around the the body, the physical body. As I said, that's Mm. been my biggest learning. It's not as much around physical health because I've been ill at times, very ill. Those were my learning lessons and I've actually experienced the most unbelievable piece of mind during that. But there's something to do with the way I engage in my body, which I'm learning about so much and see that I have a lot to learn. I've got a lot to learn in many different areas, Mm. but the satellite is my big one, blind spot. Tell us where we can find you if anybody wants to learn more about iHeart and bringing it to their schools or their communities. Uh, we www.iheartprinciples, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E-S.com or lemie.com. It's R-E-S-I-L-I-M-Y.com. And those are the two websites that you can find us. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for your story. Thank you for your knowledge. And thank you for your education and all your work you do in, in the world. Thank you, Mansana. Thanks so much. Bye till next time. Thank you for listening till the end. We highly appreciate all of our listeners. In Mental Health Together is Better, you being here means a tremendous amount to us. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like some extra boost of information and inspiration that is not on the podcast, you can go to our website, hopetorecharge.com. There's some premium content that for the cost of a cup of coffee, you can download some amazing information that will help you, a tool that will guide you through life. So don't skip a beat. Don't hesitate. Go to hopetorecharge.com and see what other offerings we have there for your mental health well-being. Thank you for joining us. And remember, if you enjoyed this and you want to say thank you, the best way of gratitude will be by you leaving a review or a comment or sharing this with a loved one. There is no greater form of gratitude for us. Thank you. Bye till next time. Looking to reduce your anxiety and stress, relax your muscles, or get a better night's sleep? Check out Maxifies.com, 100% legal hemp, where you can find doctor-formulated, lab-certified, high-quality CBD oils, tinctures, and other items, cultivated, grown, harvested, and packaged in the United States, and available in different sizes and strength formulas. Check out Maxifies.com, that's M-A-X-I-F-Y-Z.com, and use coupon code HOPE to get 10% off your order, plus free shipping. That's Maxifies.com.